Welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Justin Sandifer, um, and this is a research seminar with our friend Jishnu Das, who's professor at Georgetown. Um, and I'm going to dive right in since uh, since we're getting a late start. Thank you, everybody. Though we have our a few people here. This is our very first attempt at an in-person seminar. So a few of my colleagues here in DC, uh, Dave and Rita, and then we have our London team joining, and then. Thanks to everybody who's coming in via Zoom. Um, let's go ahead and turn right over to Jishnu, who's going to present. We were just discussing on Twitter this morning a paper which appears to have existed online since 2010. So, with 12 years of refinement um, and more years than that of data collection, um, and I see to here is online as well. Um, so feel free to correct him if he says anything wrong to hear. Um, Jishnu, why don't we turn over to you if the system is now working, fingers crossed. Hey, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, as Justin kindly mentioned, yes, this is a paper that's been a long time coming. Uh, and in fact, the earlier paper is there on slide 32. Um, it's very much there, it's just that we have expanded it a bit. And, and I think you'll see the reasons for expansion and working on it for this long are quite important because it changes the overall message that we want to provide, right? So let me just dive right into it. Um, we are interested here in, 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 the following, uh, um, in the following questions, which is, you know, private school enrollments have increased dramatically in low-income countries. So the 80 million children in South Asia enrolled in private schools. Um, and in Pakistan, this primary enrollment share increased from 5% to 35% between 1990 and 2005. You know, it stands at somewhere around 40% now. But if you look at the literature, the primary focus to date has been estimating a private school premium, right? I mean, that's where the literature has been. And so the idea is you want to try and understand uh, through you know, econometric ways on what's the impact on test scores of enrolling a randomly selected child in a private school, right? And that literature starts early. It's Jimenez and Tan did it in 1991 using a Heckman kind of selection equation. Abhijit Singh in 2015 looks at it with value added. Uh, uh, Karthik Murlidhar and, and Venkatesh Sundar Raman probably have what's at the moment the state of the art paper on this using a voucher design. And there's a substantial literature in the US as well. I mean, Derek Neal has a nice summary of it in 1998, right? Uh, the literature is gonna recover a local average treatment effect under assumption of constant effects. And let me just tell you exactly what I mean, mean uh, uh, with that. Uh, I'll tell you in a second what I mean with that. And that's going to be one possible question, right? But there are going to be many other questions that are equally legitimate once we recognize that massive expansion in choice and fundamental changes to the educational landscape due to the rise of private school, right? So what do I mean by all this? I want to make the following argument, right? Villages now have multiple public and private schools that that parents choose from, right? So it's not that your area where there's one public and one private school. You're now in villages, these are villages. So, you know, towns, cities, of course, there are tons of schools around, but even in villages, you have many, many, many schools. So the picture I'm showing here is one village in the LEAPS data, which is what I'm gonna use. And I've just put some hypothetical numbers for quality, right? But you could see, that if quality varies within village and sector, right, that's going to create treatment heterogeneity, right? So the private school effect is now going to depend on the quality of the sending school and the quality of the receiving school, right? So for example, you know, if you take the government school that's on the left-hand side corner of this map, which has a quality of 10, well, if you're going to send a kid from that school to the private school that has a quality of five, you're actually going to get a negative private school premium of minus five, right? If you're going to send the kid who is in the badly performing government school with a quality of four, 
to the private school that has a quality of 12, you're going to get a plus eight, right? So you can get, depending upon how your policy is reallocating children across different types of schools, right? And depending upon how much variation there is within village and sector, you can get a range of private school effects, right? Uh, so then the impact of policy like vouchers is gonna depend critically on the identity of schools that are in the program and the reallocations that they induce, right? So what I'm gonna, you know, similarly, if public schools are closed, the exact closure rule is really gonna matter, right? You don't want to close, you know, if you're worried about, uh, oh, there are so many public schools and in fact, the enrollments are really low, uh, the exact closure rule is gonna matter. In this village, you don't want to close the government school with a quality of 10, if you really want to close a school, you want to think about the one with the quality four, right? Now, is, is this school closure thing going to be important? Yes, you know, so in India, Gita Kingdom has this amazing paper that shows that the average public school enrollment is now 108 kids. There are 40, 400,000 public schools with enrollment less than 50 kids, right? In a way, that's remarkable because the government really did say, you know, even if you're in a tiny settlement, I'm going to make sure you get a school, right? And I think that's partly responsible for just what Justin and CGD has shown very clearly, which is this massive expansion in access, right? But it has created now a set of questions that we need to grapple with. Right? So what am I going to do here? Uh, what we're going to do here is the following. This is a paper in three parts, and I'll skip over parts of the technical things because uh, I think they're reasonably well done and you know, you can either trust me, but I have the slides to verify stuff in, in case you want it. Uh, so what I'm going to use is four years of longitudinal data collected as part of the LEAPS project to provide the first estimates of school value added from a low income country, Pakistan, right? And I'm going to demonstrate the following. First, that these measures are going to be feasible and valid for test scores in math, English, and Urdu. Second, there's going to be no trade-off between test scores and better citizenship, which is really interesting because one of the reasons why we think private schools, you know, in education are hard is because of the non-contractability of civic values, right? Which, you know, research from CGD, in fact, has been quite important in, in, in that. And I'm going to characterize the variation in school value added within and across sector and village, right? And this is going to follow methods, and this is partly why the paper was delayed. This is this is not turns out to be non-trivial. So it's going to follow the methods developed in Josh Angrist et al.'s paper in 2017 on school value added, and later refined in Abdul Qadir Oglu et al.'s paper in 2020. Recent estimates are from Romania with Ainsworth, uh, Miguel Urquiola, and and Kiki Populations, uh, but there are no estimates from low-income countries. Then I'm going to do part two, which is I'm going to link the SVA to specific policies through three different ident identification strategies that provide this average constant effect of private school effectiveness, right? So the previous paper was one of these identification strategies. That's what the previous paper largely was about. Uh, I'm going to then discuss the correspondence to the school value added distributions, right? And what I'll show you, the idea I want to propagate is that a policy is a combination of the distribution of SDA in your village and the reallocation induced through the policy. So you always want to think about a policy towards private schooling as a combination of the existing distribution and the allocation uh, reallocation induced, right? Uh, and then in part three, I'm going to study the role of school value added in the evolution of schooling markets over eight years. Right. Okay, what's the preview of the findings? So the measures are, are, are um, unbiased and valid. I'm going to show you the substantial variation in SDA. So one standard deviation, better public or private school, improves test scores by 0 0.21 to 0 0.32 standard deviations, student standard deviations, that's a lot, right? And I'm gonna show you that half of that variation is within village. So unlike say, you know, stories we hear about the US where 
there's a very strong link between the quality of schooling and poverty. You're not going to find that here. It's not that the neighborhood's determining the quality of the school. You have good and bad schools in every village. And I'm going to show you a graph that just shows all the data and we can spend endless amounts of time on that because I think that's the bulk of what's, what's here, right? Then I'm going to show you that the mean of the private school SPA distribution is 0.22 standard deviations higher, but you can recover many treatment effects from reallocating students depending on the policy, right? And I'll show you that the SPA cannot be predicted with school inputs. So this is going to be similar to the TDA literature, but it's going to be priced in private schools, right? Then in part two, we're going to go back to these average effects using three different identification strategies. And I'll show you that across all these identification strategies will recover a positive private school premium of about plus 0.15 standard deviations. And I'll show you how they can be recovered perfectly fine, well, by just looking at the distribution of SBA among sending and receiving schools. I don't even need to know what the kids gains or losses were. I just need to know the SBAs of the sending and receiving schools. Then in part three, I look at the evolution of the market over eight years. We'll show you that SBA predicts test scores eight years later. So these things are, are, are reasonably uh, uh, fixed. Right, uh, And then I'll show you that higher SBA schools are much more likely to exit the private sector, but not the public sector. And you might think that that's because oh, public schools don't close. No, over this period, there's a big school consolidation program in Pakistan and 10% of the public schools in our sample are closed. You mean lower SBAs? Uh, no, oh, sorry, lower SBA schools are more likely to exit in, in private, but not the public sector, right? Um, and in fact, what you'll find is, is they were using enrollment as a marker of, of, of quality in these places. And I'll show you that in the public schools, it doesn't work. So that's going to be a big puzzle that we are going to have to think about, about one that's been found in multiple countries, right? And then I'll show you, this is where the higher was. Higher SBA schools gain more market share over eight years. So the market's kind of working, right? We're reallocating kids more and more towards higher quality schools, more so in the private sector. So key insights, substantial within sector, within vari variation in SBA implies that public private differences will vary with the policy. Uh, problem of lower performance in public schools is going to be linked to a long left tail of the SBA distribution in the public sector. I'll show you that the top public schools are as good as the top private schools. So that's not where the problem is, right? Um, Okay, so let me give you, you know, so that was the original kind of overview of the presentation. You know, Justin, I should try and stop by one so that we can have a, yeah, a reasonable yeah. discussion on this. So I'll rush through some parts and you tell me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and uh, you should tell me when, uh, you know, you want me to take questions. And of course, please, any questions that you have, you know, let's get them as we go along. Uh, and, and in fact, this is a good time to stop. So let me check at this point if there are any questions that uh, uh, people have, and then we can we can take it forward from there. Oh, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Dive in. yeah. Uh, Shelby. Hi there. Um, I'm Shelby Carvalho. I'm one of the um, senior policy analyst on the education team, just not in the DC office today. Um, feel free to, to say if this is coming in part one in context, but I was hoping that you could give us a little bit more information on how you're measuring the civic component and whether public and private schools in Pakistan use the same curriculum. Sure. Um, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, it, it, it will come in context, uh, 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 you know, and I'll show you what we do. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so the context is villages in rural Punjab, Pakistan. Um, somebody said this, and I like it. Largest schooling system in the world. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I like it. It kind of makes it, it sounds good. Is, sorry, uh, is rural Punjab a schooling system? No, rural, uh, no, Punjab, Pakistan is the 12th largest schooling system in the world. 
<laughs> oh, come on, uh, uh, Dave. Okay, so uh, what we've exploited a lot in our previous work is that each village is a closed market, right? Which means that 90% of enrollment is for schools in the village and more than 90% of school enrollment is from within the village. I mean, we've really used this to say, how do markets look in this, in this context, right? Uh, each village has seven schools on average, four public and three private. So I think it's important to recognize that the amount of choice that's now in, there in South Asia is not just because of the rise of private schools. It's also because the public sector has always had a massive push towards access that has led to a proliferation of public schools, even in remote villages. I mean, it is quite an incredible achievement in, in, in some ways. The private schools are small for profit, uh, these are not religious schools, and there's no government regulation or subsidies for the duration of data collection, right? Uh, there have been voucher schemes and a bunch of stuff happening after that, not, not uh, uh, during this time. Uh, in response to Shelby's question, so the private school curriculum is, is governed by what's called the principle of additionality, which is that you do need to cover what is in the government curriculum, but then you can add on whatever you feel like, right? So it's not uh, uh, um, uh, restricted, right? And the private schools are co-educational, the public schools are single sex, low fee and accessible to the moderately poor. There's lots of papers on this uh, and the you know fees are kept low due to low teacher salaries. Uh, their previous papers describing the setting, they show how closed markets can be combined with experiments and study household demand. Okay, data are the survey data, uh, school surveys, and I'm just gonna go through this quite quickly because it's fairly standard. Test scores, researcher administered tests uh, in math, English, and Urdu. And then we have civic scores in, in um, 2004. I'm just trying to see whether uh, I can show you some of the, uh, uh, huh? I, I can't go back now, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I can look, that's really cool. You wanna see it again, Dave? No. <laughs> okay, so let me just show you some of the uh, summary statistics. You know, these are test scores in, in, in um, different subjects across years in the public and private schools. And one of the things you will see, you know, is kind of if you uh, start to focus in on any of these numbers, well, it is the case that the uh, public schools are always doing worse than the private schools uh, uh, at the beginning. But even if you take a place where there's substantial room for improvement, you know, say in, in filling a, a missing word in a sentence, children are learning, right? The public schools are going up by about 24 percentage points. The private schools are going up by about a little more, maybe 32 percentage points. But it's not that these are areas where nobody's learning anything at all over this time, right? So I think that idea, you know, we have, we have a paper on this saying, look, it's not that kids are not learning, right? I mean, there is definitely evidence that over these years, kids learn something, right, in, in, these, in these schools. Okay, uh, I will show you the, I don't think, uh, I will show you some of the civics tests in a while uh, uh, over there. Okay, what do, what do SVA estimates do? They're actually really simple, right? All you're going to have is you have the, the, we are going to have the child's test score in the current year on the left-hand side. We're going to have the lag test scores on the right-hand side and a bunch of different fixed effects. Those fixed effects are a school fixed effect, which is our estimate of the SVA. Uh, there's a grade fixed effect and there is a uh, time fixed effect, right? There's a little bit of additional work you need to do when you want to get the variance of SVA, because this is going to be measured with error. So we're going to use fairly standard empirical Bayes methods to shrink the estimates. Uh, so, you know, the way you think about this is we have more data when there are more children in the school. I'm going to privilege those estimates more. Where I have less, fewer children in the school, I'm going to lean more on the average scores and that's how it's going to shrink, right? Uh, um, it's a you know, fairly standard procedure and that's used only for the variance of SVA. I mean, I'm not using it whenever SVA is on the left-hand side, I'm not using trunk estimates. Uh, okay. 
My va our validation approach is threefold. The first is a forecast unbiasedness, which is to say, can I do an out of sample validation on children who are switching schools? So the idea is the following. Suppose I know the SPA of the sending and the receiving school, I should be able to predict perfectly the gain of the child who is moving without having any information on the test score of the child itself, right? Another way to think about it is if I give you the change in SP of the school here and the change in the test score of the child here and I correlate the two, I should get a coefficient of one, right? One question came up. Yep. Were there no X's in that regression? There were no... We, we, we add in X's and it doesn't. I'll show you with and without. I mean, <clears throat> the X's don't make any difference at all. And in fact, yes, that's a good point. There are lots of X's. There are X's. Okay. Then, Angrist et al. say the following, which is, yes, this forecast unbiasedness is an average, is an average validation. But that could be because some schools you're overestimating, some you're underestimating. Can we be more rigorous and say school by school, it's correct, right? So what they do is they say, okay, we have lottery data and we have our SBA estimates, right? So we have two different estimates. Uh, in the spirit of an over ID test, is it that the two are giving me the same estimate? So you can construct an over ID test, right? Because you have two different uh, uh, measures of the same, same uh, um, uh, underlying latent variable and say other two measures exactly the same. Now we don't have a lottery. What we have is schools that close, private schools that close. So we use that as an IV, right? And it's an IV which has 26 IVs because we're doing it within village, right? And we use that as an IV and say, can we construct an over ID test from that as an instrumental variable with the SBA estimates? And what do we find? Do we reject the over ID test in that case, right? Finally, there's a question of the predictive measures of SBA, right? So we're going to leave the civic values out of it, the SBA calculation and says, look, that's the other major thing that private schools are, not, are supposed to do badly or schools are you know, really matter about, does the SPA that's calculated from something else actually predict the civic values as well, right? So those are gonna be our three validations. And let me just show you the results from all three. Here's forecast unbiasedness. And we were pretty shocked with this. So this is an event study framework. Um, and here's what was happening before the kids uh, switch schools. Right? So there's no correlation between your gains and where you're moving. Here's the coefficient of one in the year of the switch. Right? And after that, you know, the, core, the, the, the confidence intervals are pretty uh, even around there. Right? So the first result seems to be, yes, I can predict perfectly the gains that switchers get by just looking at the SP of schools and not their own test scores, okay? okay. here's the over ID test. Uh, let me get rid of this uh, uh, beautiful drawing. Um, okay, so uh, we use this in a two, SL, two SLS style over ID test. And the idea here uh, is, well, first of all, there's always going to be, so we, we are going to create these 26 instruments by interacting closures of private schools with village fixed effects, right? And then these kids are going to move to public schools because the private schools closed down. Uh, and then intuitively what we're basically doing is verifying that the SPA estimates correctly predict the effect of a student of attending a different school in village J due to a closure. And we're doing it village by village. That, that's the main thing main difference, right? Uh, one issue that I should point out is we are going to use closures between 2003 and 2006 among private schools. And during this period, but not over the longer period, which we'll discuss later, uh, the private school closures are linked to enrollment, but not to test scores, which is interesting. You know, uh, I think it's partly because 
in our sample, we are sampling conditional on having a private school, which means that our marginal village is a school, is, is, is a village where the demand for education is pretty low. And by chance, it has a private school in the year that we chose. Right, so the ones that close down are not the stable closers over time. They're like these on the margin uh, movements, right? Uh, so here's the result. The first column here, we were worried like with all over ID tests that maybe there isn't enough power. But if you actually try and do it without controlling for the test score lags, you really reject pretty easily uh, the over ID test, which is what you would have liked to see, right? So it does seem to have much, quite a bit of power. Column two is that coefficient of one on the children who switch uh, on the on the IV closures, uh, and columns and and you what you see is that the over ID test doesn't reject at all, right? In fact, the 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 chi square is fairly low, so it's rejecting for when we don't control for the lag. Once we control for the lag which is what our specification is, we cannot reject the over ID test. Right? And then the last one is a better way of doing the over ID test called a UGI, which is an unbiased jackknife instrumental variable estimator. I'm not gonna go into that right now, uh, uh, but happy to uh, discuss it if and when uh, uh, we really want to. You really have to want to if you wanna discuss this. Okay. <laughs> Third, the predictive value of SVA. So key outcome in private schooling debate are civic values, which are thought to be non-contractable. So we measure civic values very much like the uh, uh, National Education Assessment uh, so, uh, Progress and, uh, in the US, which is we measure uh, civic knowledge, uh, civic disposition, and gender bias, right? So uh, civic knowledge is Basic knowledge, so for example, a question there is which of the four countries below neighbors Pakistan, you know, and it'll include Saudi Arabia, US, India, and a surprisingly large fraction of children choose Saudi Arabia, right? It says which country did Pakistan get independence from? Was it India? Was it somewhere else? Was it England? And surprisingly, a large portion chose India. So there's a lot of variation in this. The civic disposition where we ask, for instance, you know, if you have to choose choose uh, what to get for lunch in a school uh, uh, party after people have given money, how would you do it? Would you vote Democrat? Would you do it through vote? Would you let the teacher decide? Would you let a smart kid decide? Whatever, whatever right? Um, and then if there's a disaster, would you give money to the government? Would you give it to an NGO? You know, would you give it to a, a thing? And then there's gender, gender bias, which is, you know, do you think on average girls or boys are smarter kind of questions? And then some questions on decisions, right? What we find quite interestingly is all of these indices, the gender one is, is, is the wrong way just because it's coded the other way around. So it's male bias. So male bias goes down. What you find is a really strong correlation between the SBA measures and all these other measures of civic values, right? So it's not that schools that are good at language and math are particularly bad at civic values or uncorrelated. In fact, these are complements and not substitutes. This is very different from Bo Jackson's work on social emotional skills and test scores for, uh, for teachers, but we found it quite interesting that schools that are good at producing the three Rs are also the schools that are good at producing the civic values. So just to make sure I get it, this is a lower, bar for civic values, because there's no value added of civic values, or there's no proof that there's not selection on, on civic values. Absolutely, right. absolutely. I mean, it's just saying that this is predictive right. of civic values. Yeah, it's not saying that they increase civic values, that the SVA civic values, we're not saying that, right? Uh, 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 and that's a good point, uh, which is we are not claiming um, um, that thing. Okay. So where's our summary right now? So these SBA measures seem to be feasible and valid in our context. And using these SBA measures, I'm now going to characterize the variation in SBA across and within villages and sectors. Right? Um, okay. So here's here's you know if, if there are two graphs you should take away, it's this one and the next one. So this is all 112 villages in our sample. And the lines are 
actually the full range of SDA in the village, right? And we have arranged this by ascending order of SDA, right? So what you find is, yes, there's a fair bit of difference between kind of the worst village, if you like, which is in the bottom 10% to the best village, which is in the top 10%, right? But in fact, if you look at the worst village, the best school is pretty close to the average of the sample, right? And if you look at the second worst, second best village, the worst school is actually below the mean of the sample, right? And I think this is one major message to take away, which is in a place like Pakistan, rural Pakistan, there are better and worse schooling options in every village. And I'd love to know, you know, what we, what we know about this from other countries. I would love to know because I haven't seen a decomposition, say, of schooling quality within and across neighborhoods. And my understanding in the US at least is that, you know, the idea of low quality schools seems to be linked to poverty in neighborhoods. I, I, I don't, I would love to uh, know more, but I don't know about the UK or, or Europe or what we are finding in other places or, or in African countries. This is pretty shrinking. This is, uh, it, it is going to change a bit with the shrinking, but not that much. Okay, so let me show you the second graph and then we can spend a lot of time on this. Um, so here, the reds are the public schools and the blacks are the private schools. And now we've arranged it in ascending order of SDA in the public schools, which is why that, that average pink line is trending upwards, is going upwards, right? So again, there's massive variation in the quality of public schools across village, which is the trend in the, in the pink line, right? That's number one, right? So 45, but 45 to 46% of SVA variation for public and private sector respectively is within the village. So first point, right? That variation we were seeing within the village is not oh, all the bad are public and all the good are private. No, right? Within public, within private, about 50% of the variation is within the village. Second point, the best performing schools are both public and private. So even if you just count it, right? Obviously, you know, all the best public schools are on the right-hand side of your screen just because it's arranged in ascending order of public, average public. But if you just count it, you know, the best performing public uh, schools and private schools equal in number, right? In sharp contrast, the lowest performing schools are all public. Right, except for this one private guy sitting there. Uh, 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 I won't highlight him, poor guy, but anyway, I did. I shouldn't have highlighted. Uh, okay. Now, interestingly, most villages with low performing public schools also have better performing public schools. Right, so it's not the point that, oh, you're in a village with a low performing public school, you're now in a village with a low performing public school, but yeah, if I don't really like that, I can go to another public school that's a lot better. And I think that sub should substantially change the conversation for how we start thinking about public and, and private in this context, right? So literally, I'm sorry for singling out this other village once more, literally the only one where all the schools are, are below the 10% is this one here. Right, and this one here. I couldn't find any other, I'd be happy if you were to find another, but I couldn't find any other village where both, where all the public schools are below the 10% uh, 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 mark. So that's really interesting, right? And there's so many villages you find where, I mean, look at this one, like a terrible public school and a great public school. Right? And can you say anything about are they rationing access to the great public schools? They're not, there's no, we know for sure there's no rationed access to the public schools, right? In fact, what I'll show you is there's no correlation between enrollment, uh, between enrollment sizes and quality in the public schools, like zero. 
right? Uh, uh, I, I'll show you that. Uh, you know, you, you'll see that, right? And sorry if this was from before, but so if you're in a village and there are three public schools, is it just completely you can go to whichever one, or are you sort of it, they're, they're sex segregated? So, mm -hmm. so fifty percent of this bad public schools. We can wait. Come to that later. Is because you are the only girls or the only boys. But another fifty percent is yeah, you have just gone somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? And we don't even know how to think about the the only boys, only girls because there's a private school you could go to. That's always much you know that's better, right? right? So I just, you know, and let's keep that for the discussion, but this is a fundamental point, right? I mean, how much here is parental responsibility versus state responsibility, right? How do we want to think about this? And I think they're fundamentally different questions that we're raising, mm -hmm. which is why it took another 12, 12 years. I hope it's been worth the 12 yeah. years. But, uh, okay, so you can put these distributions together, you know, you'll get something and you'll see that the, the, the right-hand side is the same for public and private, the left-hand side is Okay, so what's a summary? You know, uh, uh, let me just put these these numbers up uh, and see if there are any questions on results one, two, and three, and then I'll dive into the public-private differences as an application. Any any questions on this so far? Steve asks, how can SDA measures be valid if much of the difference in value added is due to unmeasured differences in SES between the schools? I'm not sure I, Steve, uh, Steve, Stephen, please, would you, could you uh, uh, explain that question a bit? I'm trying to figure it out. Sure. Um, much of the research on public-private differences rest on controlling for SES and controlling for SES differences. Why is school value added any different? You can, I mean, we control for SES. I mean, How? there's no, just by including it as X's. I mean, why would it threaten? What we are showing is it's for sure it's valid because I can predict the gains perfectly in out of samples. How did you control for SES is my question. What is the metric? Uh, it's just the, the parental education and the assets. But all I'm claiming is it doesn't matter whether I control for it or not, as long as I can show, demonstrate the validity of the SDA, which is what we are doing, right? One more here. Any age restriction in private schools? Uh, no, no. So Steve, the right way to think about it is it is that the lag test score is a really powerful, sufficient statistic for all kinds of sorting. I think that's the main message we are getting from all the value added literature, whether it's the TVA, the teacher value added literature, or now the school value added literature. And last, before we let you move on, gender differences in these um, public private differentials? Not really. Not really. Girls tend to do a little better in reading. Boys tend to do a little better in math, but not not substantively. Nothing major. So it's not like girls' schools are no nothing at all. Not at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. You're being so brief. I can add one more. Uh, <laughs> can you give us any? Like you're telling us in terms of percentiles. Please asking how big are these effect sizes? Is there something about? in real terms about is this variance, I don't know what scale you could put this on to make this uh, bigger than a bread box, but you know. Here, it's right here. So a private school a, attending a one standard deviation better private school increases mean test scores by 0 0.21 standard deviations, right? Uh, and public schools attending a one standard deviation better public school increases mean test scores by 0.32 standard deviations. And in general, we find that in a year you gain about 0.4 standard deviations. So think about it as a one standard deviation better school is going to get you about six to nine months additional learning over the year, right? which is a lot, I feel. I mean, it's a, it's a huge number. Yeah. 
right. Okay. Great. Blow on. Okay. So let me blow on. Uh, go on. So private school pre. So the variation in SVA within village and sector implies that there can be multiple estimates of the private school test. Right. What I want to point out is that the fact that we have estimated the distribution of SVA is not going to eliminate the need for these kind of average effect estimates of the private school test score premium, because our our estimates are policy irrelevant, right? Uh, there's nothing, I mean, it doesn't map into any policy, right? Now, if the SPA is stable, any policy effect, what we call a policy effect is a weighted average of SVAs where the weights for each school is the reallocation induced through the policy, right? So the estimates in the literature thus far are such weighted average in the presence of considerable treatment heterogeneity rather than private school premium under homogenous treatments. That's the fundamental way to think about this, right? You know, that's not what's in the literature. It's not a private school premium. It's that whatever policy you studied reallocated kids in a way that it produced the effect you saw, right? To understand reallocation induced through a policy, the only way to do it is to actually study the policy, right? So that you can always think about a policy as here's the distribution of SPA. How is it going to move kids across schools? Let's weight that up. That's going to be my effect, right? Uh, and I'm going to illustrate this point by considering constant effect estimates of private school premium using three different identification strategies that correspond to different policies, okay? Uh, the first one, so first, let me show you that anything is possible, right? That you can get a wide range of private school premium. So here, so the first thing, the public to best private, we are simulating, hey, what would happen if you took all the kids from public schools and moved them to the best private school, right? Under the assumption that no supply effect, I mean, like, you know, for obvious reasons, but uh, then the P10 tells you, well, some of these kids would have come from really great public schools, right? And they'll actually lose test scores a little bit, like maybe minus 0.1 standard deviations. Some of them will, will have come from really bad public schools and they'll gain, that's the P90 number, by 0.5 standard deviations with a mean of 0.2, right? You could also have a policy that moves kids from public, all public to the worst private school within the same village, always within the same village, right? And now you see, well, the means are now pretty insignificant. It's like 0.07 SD, right? And the P10s, and in fact, I think even the P25s are all highly negative, right? So you could have very negative private school premium and maybe very positive private school premium. You could go all the way from minus 0.5 to plus 0.5, plus 0.7, right? Uh, so what I'm gonna show you is results from three approaches. One is a value added approach which is very similar to what we have been doing for the SDA. The difference is I'm going to control for child fixed effects. So I'm going to look at what's the effect among children who are switching schools, okay? Then you will still be worried about selection coming in maybe because the children who are switching, maybe there's a time varying thing. Maybe, you know, your, your income went down dramatically as we have seen with COVID and children moved out of private to public schools, but maybe that income alone will be a big cause. So we're going to IV for the movement with the closure of private schools, right? So the people who are familiar with the firm literature know Larry Katz's famous paper on people switching firms versus firms closing down as the same idea here, right? Uh, uh, on looking at these closures. And then we use a distance IV, which was our original paper. So point part three slide, whatever is our original paper. Uh, um, it's an instrument for private school attendance with relative distance to private versus public schools based on historical settlement factors. Okay. Let me not go over these in big detail because you know uh, 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 we're running out of time. Uh, let me just show you the distance ID is kind of cool because it exploits historical settlements in the region. So these canal colonies in Punjab was the largest irrigation project the world has ever seen in the 19th century. Uh, it led to center periphery settlement patterns with richer households in the center, right? 
Um, so it's really interesting when you read their policy documents, they said, we are looking for households to settle in these canal colonies because they built the canals. Now they want talented farmers. So they're like, we don't want people. And these are the language they use. We don't want people with a history of idiocy in the family, uh, existing debts, you know, all these things that essentially ruled out, you know, was their attempts at seriously positive selection. Uh, as my parents said uh, after reading this, we now understand why we never got any land from the British, uh, uh, <laughs> given my family history. But what it more seriously, what it meant was very interestingly these settlement patterns. This is all the schools and everything put on a common coordinate system. What you find is look, the the private schools, which is the green, are all in the center of the village, and the public schools are way more spread out, right? But the center of the village is where all the rich people are because that's where your settlements happen, right? That's where these positively selected people were settled. So what we say is that the way to take care of this because public schools are now on this cheaper public land is to instrument for the difference between the distance to the closest public and private school. So the idea is, well, if I'm on the Northwest corner of the village, Right, so I'm going to create circles around the center of the village, and then if I was and look at people only on those circles, and if I was on the northwest corner, but I built the public school here, I'm really far. Mm -hmm. But if I'm on this other corner, equally far from the center, I'm much closer to the public and far from the private school. Right, so those are the three we use. Uh, so the key control is the distance to the center, and the intuition is I'm going to compare two equally wealthy households equally distant to the center, but one on the same side of the village as the public school at the other one, right? And we do the usual checks. This is not correlated with all. Uh, first stage is, you know, let me not do this. We can come back to it. Here's the main result, which is kind of regardless of what we do and depending on uh, 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 this thing, uh, 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 we find a positive private school premium. So what are these? These are, you know, I've tried to put all the effect sizes on the same graph. Uh, we have the Stata code for this, if you want to make your, your graphs look nice. <laughs> the first two are just OLS, then child fixed effects, then the closure IV, which are these X's here, right? So these X's down here are, are telling you uh, which specification you're seeing, right? And then uh, uh, partly coming to this question of what's happening with SES, we always are showing you a baseline without SES controls and with SES controls. It doesn't make any difference at all in our context. What you see, two things. One is all the estimates are positive and remarkably similar, about 0.15 SD, right? Including civics where the effect sizes are smaller, but they're all in the positive territory and some of them are fairly significant, right? The one that's slightly different, well, it depends again on how much you wanna trust confidence intervals versus pointers. This is the school closure IV, which is giving us larger, larger estimates. And I'll tell you exactly why, why that's happening. Uh, same thing with subjects. Uh, so the reason why we are getting higher number for the school closure IV is because these public schools, the private schools that closed, closed in villages where the public schools were terrible, right? And the reason for that was because when we sampled, we sampled with the villages that have at least one private school. So we picked up a bunch of marginal villages where the demand for education was pretty small, but a measurement error in that year created a private school. And when that private school closes down, the children are actually moving to worst performing public schools. That's the only one. And again, it kind of depends on how much you want to trust the uh, uh, standard errors, confidence intervals versus the point estimates. But what this is saying is look, in theory, you could have got negative numbers. There's nothing that stops us from getting negative numbers given the distributions. But all it's saying is people are consistent, right? When they're moving from public to private, they're not moving from free public great schools to terrible fee charging private schools. They tend to move from lower performing public to higher performing private, right? 
or the other way around, if, if, if need be, right? So each of these policies are inducing reallocations that move children from worse performing public to better performing private schools. So how do these estimates compare to the SPA estimate? Uh, so if I so consider the estimate for children switching schools, imagine there are three schools, A, B, and C. So the switching estimate is the weighted average of SEA differences between schools, where the weights are the number of children switching between each pair. So I can actually recover that by just multiplying up the SVAs with these weights because I know where children are moving, right? If I do that and compare, uh, so we should be able to recover the switching and school closure estimates if we know the exact switch pairs and the SVA of schools, right? So for the mean test score, the child fixed effect estimate is 0.168, which compares to 0.164 if I use the SPA of sending and receiving schools and switch shares. Yeah. We're coming really, really yeah. close to, to giving you the right numbers. Right? Yeah. And here's what's happening on the closure estimate, which is higher. So here's the result, which is the villages that had a private school closure in this initial period had lower performing public schools. Right? And in fact, the performance was lower the closer the public school was to the private school, which kind of makes sense, right? You want to set up your private school next to a poorly performing uh, uh, public school. Yep. Okay, so I'm not going to take any questions for two seconds now. I'm not going to go over the, the summary. Uh, so the last part, give me five minutes. There's this question of why is there a private school too? Right? What's, what's going on? So we want to understand if the markets are functioning well. So we're going to go back in 2011, uh, six years later, to repeat this exercise. We're going to do two things. We're going to try and examine the predictive value of SBA. Right? Is this SBA stable, as well as correlation between the SBA exits and market shares? But not. we can't compute the SBA of the new schools and existing schools in 2011 because we don't have lag test schools at that point. And just to tell you, over this time, there's massive movement in the market. So 33% of the private schools that were there in 2003 had closed down. 12% of public schools that were present in 2003 had closed. By definition, all the children are new, right? And then in the private sector, 90% of the teachers have turned over, right? And in the public sector, 50% of the teachers have turned over. So these are substantially new schools in some way. The teachers are different, the head teachers are different, the school children are different, right? First question, can SBA be predicted from inputs? Answer is no. We have a really wide list of school inputs. We get less than 2% of the variation in public and less than 8% of variation in private. Just can't predict it, right? Uh, we're trying to see whether ML can improve it, but you know we have a list of like 500 attributes and we're not getting anything. Then the question is, is it at least observable, right? Turns out in private schools, yes. What's the strongest predictor of the fee of a private school? It's the SBA, even within the village, right? Look at the number. The coefficient estimate is 833 on a mean of 800 of, of something like 1500. So it's saying, if you can push up your SBA by a standard deviation, you increase your private school fees by like 50%. Right, and it's highly significant. Uh, 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 you know, it's it's significant uh, between two and three on the T stats with an adjusted R square of something like 0.2, uh, just from the SPA variation. Right. More surprisingly, given that the private schools that are higher SPA are charging higher fees, they also have higher enrollments, which is the blue part. But now look at the public schools, which are all free. That's the red part. There's zero correlation between enrollment and SVA in the public schools. Now, you might think that's really weird. Actually, given the literature, the weird part is the private schools. So in the US, Parag and all these guys are systematically finding that people choose on selectivity, not on SVA. And then, so if, for example, people who know New York, apparently they're these highly selective schools like Stevenson or something, something. Mm -hmm and they do nothing for college entry or test scores, right? It's, they are not better SBA schools, right? So they systematically find a red line, right? In Romania, 
uh, uh, Miguel, Ainsworth, Fiola, uh, sorry, uh, Popelish is finding exactly the same thing. The exception, so this is the first result that market share is higher for higher SDS groups. And now let me finish off one slide, which is what happens over time. So let me just show you. So higher SBA schools are increasing market share over these eight years. Interestingly, the SBA that we had built between 2003 and six is predictive of test scores six to eight years later. This is not a small correlation, it's 0.7, right? Then higher SBA schools are less likely to exit. Again, large numbers, 17 percentage points on a mean of 15, right? Uh, and then you have a penalty of smallness, which is very well known in the firm literature. If you're a small firm, you're more likely to close. Here's the difference between public and private. So these effects are much larger in private. I mean, the correlation in private is 0.8, despite the fact that 90% of teachers have turned over. So these are schools that are maintaining their position. The guy who's low SBA is saying, I want to be a low SBA, low fee school, right? And that's fine. Right? You want to be a Toyota in a differentiated market. Right? Not everybody wants to be a Mercedes. Right? The guys who are Mercedes are clear this is the market position we're taking. Right? And you see the closures, the bad schools are closing down more often. Right? Uh, in public sector, very interestingly, these numbers are much more muted. So despite the fact that teachers are churning over less, the correlation is smaller. So the SPA is a little less stable. There's no correlation with closure that's significant, even though the, the, the effect size is reasonable, right? Uh, and that's because they use enrollment as a marker of should we close down this school or not. And enrollment itself is not correlated with SPA in the public schools, right? Okay, so that's it. Uh, those, so here's the summary. Uh, in this stuff, uh, and you know what I found very interesting is this idea that there are low quality public schools that drive down the average, uh, and it's not that in these low quality public schools it's poor kids or less educated parents. No, nope. it is no correlation between SPA and public sector and household SES. Uh, so it raises very difficult questions that I don't know. I almost feel like we need ethnographic work on what constitutes a culture of a school. Because it's not, you know, I think the main thing we are learning, Dave, Justin, Rita, is that this is not a neighborhood effect. It's not the culture of the neighborhood. There's some culture of a school that's remaining there, despite teachers moving, children moving. It's all in the same neighborhood. And somehow it's transmitting through propagating through generations, which, you know, I, is, is something new. I, I don't, I didn't know it, right? Uh, and why do low quality public schools persist when there are other options available uh, on this, right? So let me conclude uh, here. So large increases in private schools have altered the education landscape. And one fundamental part of this transformation is the increase in the availability of choice. In our context, there's a positive and significant private school premium in test scores, but I feel the bigger picture here is this massive variation in school quality within village and within sector. And if you were to ask me, I would say, honestly, we have to stop estimating average effects and constant effects because that's just, you know, that's like 10% of the picture. I mean, we're missing so much when we, when we do that, right? Uh, for the private sector, SBA correlates with prices and enrollment and over eight years exits and market shares. Uh, for the public sector, SBA does not correlate with enrollments or exits, but does, does correlate, sorry, with market share over eight years. And then the impact of any policy, you can see vouchers, public school closures, is gonna depend on the precise reallocation induced through the policy. I think this is what policymakers would like, is always your distribution of SBA and your best guess of the reallocation of the policy. That's what we really want to start with. Okay, so let me stop there. You've been super patient as a, as a group. I'll on in case anybody yeah. wants to go to any particular slide and, and uh, stop there. Sorry for me. No, no, uh, thank you very much, Tishnu. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so no, apologies for our technical difficulties. I'll see if I can talk without too much feedback. I'm pushing away from Tishnu here. <laughs>
And then that's going to well, be. Let's save the time and just say, Dave, why don't you ask your question? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, two questions. One is you showed us really high, strikingly high um, turnover among teachers. What about principals? Yeah, we're checking that. Okay, because it does seem like when you think of a community of a school, I mean, the principal is one of the first things that you think of I know is like the establishing school, the, teacher, the principal will have turned over mm -hmm. in the private school because it's set up by a school owner. I don't know the separation between the school owner and principal in all these cases. My suspicion will be that the school owner, will, the school owner won't have turned over usually. Uh, uh, the principal, I'm going to have to check. My guess is you know, in a lot of these cases, the school owner is the principal himself. Right, and so they wouldn't turn over. I mean, wouldn't but these are, these are numbers we should check. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the other question is how, like what percentage of kids who are going to public schools go to the closest public school that they can go to? Like, is, do so most distance is a huge, so we have a paper that kind of estimates these elasticities. Distance is the biggest predictor. Even within the village. Even within the village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to give you some numbers, you know, if you go off by, if your school is like 200, 300 meters further, the probability of attending it is going to drop by like 20%. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Does it even, does it also explain a lot of the movement between, I guess you came with this, the Abby, between public and private? Like, oh, the public school is a little further away, so we're just going to go to a private. Not because, because we are not going to have, that movement is not necessarily induced by the construction of new schools between 2003 and six, right? So those schools always existed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right, right, right. Uh, 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 and we are abstracting away from why the kids moved. Mm -hmm. At least in the place where it closed down, we have an exogenous reason. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, um, okay, I'm going to ask questions if nobody raises their hand. Um, so continuing on the same theme, I mean, you're just talking a lot about school value added as opposed to teacher value added. Yeah. Do you have any hope of doing, I mean, it's amazing that you can do the, the, the pupil mover design, do teachers move between these schools? Teachers do move and we did construct, I mean, we looked at, so the problem, uh, teachers do move, we know how they move. There's also no culture of uh, not poaching from other schools, we asked them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is they're not going to move, we're not never going to get enough sample because these are not admin data. So we are testing only one grade or two grades in the school. We're just not going to be able to use that for any empirical work. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, okay, let me read No, out. but I think the, in the public sector, that's what we should really be thinking about because these teachers are moving across schools and we should be thinking about following them, seeing what happens to the kids. You know, that's Chetty's design for the TDA. Yeah. Um, how applicable are the findings about generally rising SVA that lower quality schools stay longer in public school systems and the SVA not being schools to low income and insular remote places in the US or other Western countries? I don't know what's your sense. <laughs> I mean, this is one that, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I would love to know. I mean, I think I, I find within the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's very different from the conversation in the US. I don't know about other countries. I don't know how much choice there is and I don't know how much variation there is. I, I would love to know of it. And if anybody has any suggestions, I'll follow up. Um, now, now people are trying to, so in private school, Nancy says, and Nancy Birdsell says this reminds her of the situation in her, her, her DC neighborhood. Um, there is considerable choice among, among public schools. I see. She missed the first half of your answer. Um, uh, I think that was a comment more than a question. Claire uh, says In private school, is the culture of the high SBA schools driven by the propri proprietor's ideal on education? I mean, I, uh, Claire, I, I'll tell you the truth, which is I feel we have we have got to the point where we're at the end of our rope on what we can say without serious ethnographic and qualitative work. I think as a group, we have not managed to bring in 
the kind of serious sociologists who have done such deep ethnographies in American schools, you know, whether it's Anne Ferguson in San Francisco, whether it's, uh, 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 you know, understanding particular school cultures. And I'm clearer and clearer that this is really, we need a serious effort on that front now to explain some of these findings. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be unashamedly uh, um, pleading in saying, if people are interested in that, you know, we can actually tell you which schools are good. You know, if you're willing to spend a month there trying to think this thing through with them, uh, that'd be wonderful. Um, question from Vin, no, Vicente Garcia. Does the public school curriculum include religious content? Or does the private school curriculum? I mean, remarkably less, uh, remarkably uh, 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 little would be my answer. Uh, we don't find it in the, in the time use rosters of schools uh, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel uh, uh, that, and the main parental, parents actually complain a little bit that they don't teach them Islamiyat, which is more kind of a way of living, you know, which is really civic stuff in a way. Uh, rather than religion, but uh, no demand, I think, among parents for uh, religious education at all in the primary schools. So I think I misrepresented Nancy's question was a question, not a comment. Um, she said she missed the first half, but I, but I still want to push you on it. Like, is there actually choice among public schools um, within the village? And I guess you obviously show there are multiple public schools within the village. Um, but building on Nancy's question, I mean, it is kind of mysterious, right? The, you, on the one hand, you're saying parents are shopping and willing to pay more for a higher value added private school. And yet there's no rationing and the public schools are free. Is it distance that's stopping them from going across town? Like, why are they not well, exercising or, alternatively, public so, so you could write down a model where you say, hey, this is a kid who's going to benefit from greater education, right? So one of the things we've been working on is we asked parents kind of how intelligent they thought their kids were, right? And the intelligence gap beats everything else 16 years later. So parents, so the, so the ones they said are, oh, not that intelligent. Now, I don't know how to interpret that. I'll just give you a correlation. Had almost eight, to, eight years less education than the ones they said were super intelligent like six to eight years, this is the strongest prediction, right? Now, could it be that there's a model we could write where they say, oh, that kid, man, I just don't have the energy to put him through schooling, right? I mean, every time he goes, it's a mess, right? Let's just put him in whatever is the most convenient and closest thing, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. Uh, and my worry is that's partly what's going on is that the set of children who are in the low quality public schools is kind of some kind of default schooling for kids that parents don't want to invest a lot. And that's not a parental thing because you know this intelligence thing we are finding 90% of the variation is within households. And it's not gender because they say girls are equally intelligent as boys, right? So they don't, you know, it's not that easy. Two finger from Barbara runs on that. Do you have intrafamily enrollment? Yes. In, you do intra family, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm not keeping up with the chat here, so I'll keep reading them out. So that's or you can, well, I can, I can, you can read them. them. Yeah, Dave is an innovation here, the just who knows how to read. <laughs> so Celeste asks, Does this no, I know how to read. Does this research <laughs> lead you to any public policy recommendations to see better results in the public schools? Celeste, I feel. Like as as a you know card carrying empiricist, I there's any number of things I could uh, 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 voice, but I feel we need to show the evidence. The one paper we are quite excited about is work that we've been doing on school grants that shows big improvements in the public schools as a result. Uh, but I think you know as a whole, that's exactly the right place where we need to invest. Uh, school management practices, I don't know, this came up after, you know, as a big deal after uh, 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 we left. Uh, the data are going to be, we're putting up a good website and the data are going to be public by end of April. So, you know, people can look through the questionnaires and see if anything kind of correlates with, you know, school management, happy to uh, uh, 
to do to do that. Okay. This is your last call then. Um, Dave. Well, so something you alluded to earlier, Jishnu, was about this sort of how we think of this as like a government role versus a parental role. And I just love to hear you talk a little bit more about what you see as the potential tension there. So, I, I mean, think about how this, so here's what I was thinking. I was thinking about how would we now honestly have a conversation with an education center, right? Our earlier conversations would be, hey, look at your average schools. They're pretty bad, you know, all of this kind of stuff. The school teachers are absent, blah, blah, blah. If they knew this data, they would say, look, you know, it's true that I don't have that much control over what my staff are doing, right? I find it, it's really hard to fire. You know, we don't have those systems in place. Yes, yes, we are trying to build it. But meanwhile, we don't want to disadvantage the kids. So what I've done is I've built six schools in every village. And I know that some of them will be good, some of them are bad because some teachers are just much more committed, you know, some places the culture develops. So, you know, wherever you're telling me that they're bad schools, then you'll find they're also good schools. Now it's up to the parents. If they don't want to send their children to the good schools, which we have made free, we have made sure that they're reasonable, what else can I do? Right? You can, that conversation is now different. Right? And I wonder what our right response to that is. Mm -hmm. Right? I think it's an interesting conversation to start. Right? Uh, uh, and one I would, you know, uh, I, I think will lead to very interesting directions. When it relates back, this relates back to your earlier work on like scorecards across public and private. And it seems like parents do respond. Oh, absolutely with all that information. Yeah. And so I guess that's conceivably the next step. So, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think we can think about, yeah, I mean, so you can think about, so the interesting part there and both in the school grants and that paper and in the long term is we find that it increases school test scores. It doesn't change allocation. Mm. It's turning out to be really hard to change allocation around, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, even if you look at vouchers, right? In these cases, you would expect, hey, vouchers would be great because it'll allow children to leave the poorly performing public schools. But if people know and they are uh, attending, still attending the poorly public private public schools, there must be some really strong attachment. To them. So it's really hard to move them out of them, right? Uh, uh, and I, I think that's, you know, that's, I think we need to move there, Dave, but I think we are running out of ideas without some serious qualitative work. Uh, so, you know, I've read a lot of this literature coming from the sociologists on education in the US and we are so far behind on that part mm -hmm. uh, that I think it's worth thinking about how to push that out. Nice. Okay, um, we, we ran a little bit over, um, but I think we should wrap up here. Uh, unless Rita, were you putting your hand up? No. Um, Thanks everybody for your patience with our technical difficulties at the beginning and for all the excellent questions um, and stay in touch. We'll be back with one of these seminars before too long soon. Thank you very much, Jishnu. You're welcome. Bye everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>